I'm still a bit behind on adding videos for the Fantasy For Real football show onto the YouTube channel, but futures are my absolute favorite, and I wanted to make sure my first positional run-through for the 2025 rookie class made it to YouTube. The full podcast, including a bit more context, can be found under the Fantasy For Real title wherever you get your podcasts. With all that said, let's get into some 2025 way, way too early rankings. No position is quite like quarterback in the way that development and progression really matter to the position, and that's probably why we see, in general, most of the early drafted quarterbacks be early declares. Yes, you can obviously point to all kinds of quarterbacks, and even in this class, there's probably Jaden Daniels. I say probably because this has been recorded before the NFL draft, but you can also point out the fact that three of the top four, again, most likely in the 2024 class, were early declares between Williams, May, and J.J. McCarthy. The top three in the 2023 class, those top three and the top four picks, were all early declares. The top quarterback in 2022 was not an early declare, but that was the 20th overall pick in Kenny Pickett. And while the 2021 class has not ended up the way that people have hoped for it to be, the top four were early declares. So when you look at, say, the picks in the top seven, the top 11, it's been really slanted towards these early declares. So because it brings up some slightly different conversations at quarterback in particular, I'm going to start this quarterback positional breakdown looking at only the quarterbacks who are still able to become early declares because they've only spent two years in college so far. I think for at least most people, there are two primary candidates who could be the quarterback one if we focus on the early declares. I'm going to start with talking about the Texas A&M quarterback, Connor Wigman. Now, the biggest thing to say right off the bat with Connor Wigman is that I do not actually believe that Connor Wigman will be in the 2025 draft class. And the essential reason is because he got hurt last year. I think Connor Wigman in general has shown the most. He's the one that I have the most. If you ask me who to, I would bet on the most in a Debbie league right now, it is probably Connor Wigman. But I don't think he's going to be part of the 2025 class. And the reason for that is because he has played in only nine games so far in his career. One of them he left from injury. One of them he came in in the, like, say, second half for the starter. It was the first game he ever played in. I don't know exactly what point in the game he came in, but he had far less reps in that game than the starter. So he's basically had seven games in which he started and finished. One target number I've heard in terms of game started is right around 25, right? So if Connor Wigman starts all 12 games, if he makes the SEC championship, if he wins the SEC championship, or I guess he wouldn't want to win the SEC championship because he wouldn't want to get a bye. Anyway, so he loses the SEC championship. He plays one playoff game, wins it, plays another playoff game, wins it because, you know, we're we're in the 12-team playoff mile now. Now he gets a third playoff game. He could potentially get up to 16 games but even with 16 games he would only have 23 games started and finished which is under that key number of 25 and i think the key number of 25 really does make sense i i have heard people like say on broadcasts on the people that are the the scouting people say that number as number as a target number that teams are looking for but in general i just think it makes logical sense in the fact that it's basically staying completely healthy for two collegiate seasons i think teams want to see that and i think that's kind of the reason reason that you see players like Carson Beck you know and Carson and I think the Carson Beck thing is a good comparison I'll get into Carson Beck in a little bit but Carson Beck had some promise a very good season but it was the first year he ever started and the last two games weren't as good you jump into the NFL off of that people aren't going to know what to make of you I feel like Connor Wigman the only way he's going to jump into the NFL off of this season is if he's basically flawless but to get into Connor Wigman himself if you were to declare this year he would be 22 years one month as of September 1st 2025 he is listed at six foot three 215 pounds the biggest thing positive right away that you can say about Connor Wigman is that he started his first year in the SEC which a true freshman starting in the SEC especially in this day and age is a very impressive thing he showed really promising signs too at the start of that sophomore year now he did play some bad competition but when he played the bad competition he was nearly flawless almost 80 percent completion in those games 600 yards 10.6 yards in attempt six touchdowns zero interceptions now some of his surface numbers against Miami of Florida when he played in that game don't look as great but there's some under the hood things that look really impressive specifically for a couple of the statistics that uh, we should be looking for in scouting for 
uh, projecting guys and, and looking for specifically red flag areas, which you should, should be looking for for young quarterbacks because quarterbacks that have red flags, you should be wor- more worried about developing. Specifically in Connor Wigman's case, I'm talking about the eye-popping 29 pressures and only one sack, right? That's incredibly impressive. Over his career, he's had 290 dropbacks. He's been pressured 113 times and he's only taken 13 sacks. That's a very impressive overall ratio for a young quarterback. So the bottom line, Connor Wigman is a player that I am keeping my eye on more than a lot of players. But if you're just talking about 2025 quarterbacks, I think he's unlikely to even be a part of the class because I think he's very much more likely to be a part of the 2026 class because of his lack of games played so far in his career. Drew Aller of Penn State is the second quarterback to talk about and the other quarterback that I think can have a really viable argument in the early declares to be the quarterback one. He's a prototype in so many ways. He's the guy that people are immediately going to compare to someone like Justin Herbert. Drew Aller is six foot five, 241 pounds. He is also someone that you can make the argument that he is very young and can probably develop based on that age. Maybe you can, you know, see see more upside because of that age, right? He is 21 years, six months as of September 1st, 2025. That puts him between Anthony Richardson and JJ McCarthy. The most impressive thing about Drew Aller is his ability to avoid negative plays if drew aller was a very fast rushing quarterback based on my principal theories about like uh, rushing quarterbacks needing to avoid negative plays i would adore this profile because of how beautiful he is at uh, avoiding negative plays whatever that means in that context but 16 sacks and 147 pressures that's a very good rate he's also only thrown two interceptions with five turnover worthy plays in 499 dropbacks right so two interceptions and 450 pass attempts that is an amazing ratio for a player and again also avoid sacks so what's the problem why isn't he the quarterback one because despite the fact that he avoids turnovers turnovers he doesn't make very many plays and that's the big problem right now his completion percentage overall in the season was very poor and his completion percentage in the big games was very very bad and i get that you know penn state has very had very poor wide receiver play last year and i don't want to get away from that but it it is just hard to wrap your head around a number one overall pick who against michigan ohio state have numbers that are this aggressively bad 28 of 66, 42.4% completion, 261 yards, that's less than four yards per attempt, two touchdowns with one big time throw, and two turnover worthy plays. So in those games, his big time throw turnover worthy play ratio was very bad because he only had one big time throw. And that's really my big thing about uh, turnover prevention right now. I, Drew Aller is so good at it right now. I do think there's something about it there. But I generally don't trust turnover prevention if you're not also scoring the big time throws. Because if you're not actually pushing the ball down the field, then are you actually preventing turnovers? Or are you just being ultra conservative? Because being ultra conservative is not going to work at the NFL level. You have to be able to push the ball down the field and, and, and make plays consistently to be able to be a player at the next level. And so you, you have to be able to know when someone's NFL open, I guess is what I'm getting at. If you're always not throwing at a guy who might be NFL open, you can avoid turnovers and that'll look good at avoiding turnovers, but you might not actually be doing things that are very translatable at the NFL level because if you're passing up on those reads, that's a big problem. Now, I don't know if that's necessarily Drew Aller's problem. I've watched a lot of them, but as I've said, at this stage, I believe more in just general analytics and traits. And the trait problem is that there are problems, I believe, in the accuracy independent of these wide receivers. I do not believe he's as consistent as he needs to be, at least at this point of his career. Now, that could obviously change, and there's plenty of time for it to change. He's a very young quarterback. He's such a young quarterback that if he ended up staying for four years, he would still be a young quarterback in 2026. But as of right now, it's it's simply a matter of proof, right? What have you proven? Drew Aller has not proven enough to me. Could he end up being the next J.J. McCarthy? Certainly. I think that is really the trajectory you look at him. They're very different. They're very physically different. They, they have different skill sets. But you're talking about a guy who in J.J. McCarthy went from like a 60% completion guy to a 70% completion guy from his second to his third year. So even though there were all these things to complain about, even though I myself don't believe that he got to the thresholds that I necessarily look for, if Drew Aller makes that kind of leap at his age, I think people will be interested in, because he also gets praised for his intangibles and things like that. 
So I think Drew Aller, I have more skepticism about than Connor Wigman because I've seen more negative play than Connor Wigman, but there's a capacity for a lot of upside in Drew Aller's play. And he's the kind of guy who can make the McCarthy leap. And even if he's not perfect this year, even if he's in a similar, I I do think it can be a similar way to McCarthy, not even with a national title, just a very conservative game plan, but one that you're actually getting to a good completion percentage, a good yards per attempt compared to the numbers on paper that Drew Aller put up in 2023, which were pretty poor. And then the, the biggest name that kind of would be talked about around that is, is Cade Klubnik. I think Cade Klubnik has shown that he's probably not in the day one conversation. Cade Klubnik was always a guy. Now, to be fair, he was Cade Klubnik, the quarterback from Clemson, was a very narrow, thin guy coming out of high school. And so those kind of guys you do project to potentially get bigger and bigger and add more arm strength. But he was always the kind of guy that people always talked about and said, well, I don't, I don't know if he's like the highest upside guy. He might be like a Kirk Cousins. And so when people are already saying, that about someone even a highly rated freshman you know that's still a good thing but you have to you know then play good quarterback and command the offense very well the the things that you need to do to prove and live up to that expectation and Cade Klubnik has the exact same big time throw issue by a percentage wise to Drew Aller but he has about triple the turnover worthy plays right Cade Klubnik has more turnover turnover worthy plays than big time throws and we haven't seen the wow traits either and while there have been problems with Clemson's offense if you want to go down that rabbit hole there's been enough positive things involved with Clemson's office that offense that just should be better than what Cade Klubnik has put up so far so Cade Klubnik would be a guy that I'm not even really looking to buy in Debbie leagues right now uh I mean obviously you're always keeping an eye on these guys they can always make a leap but I have not really liked what I've seen from him even compared to guys like say a Aller who's under 60 percent completion I still have a lot more faith in Aller than a Cade Klubnik Noah Fafita is probably the highest performing player on this list that would be, or or just any kind of list, right? So I was looking through prospect or high school prospect lists that would align with this draft class and just trying to find who has actually performed well at this level and just tried to find name that, you know, I've seen play really well on Saturdays. And the highest ranking name that I got to was probably Noah Fafita because Noah Fafita is a pretty good quarterback for Arizona. But the thing is, I just, man, Noah Fafita is going to be hard to talk into because his listed height is five foot 11 and you can see it right away, right? Like I kind of wasn't even... I kind of forgot that or something. I don't know if forgot that's the right term, but I hadn't actually done the due diligence on Noah Fafita. And I said that the last couple of times I've brought up Noah Fafita because I've watched Tet, M- Tet McMillan, who we'll talk about later, Tetaroa McMillan, who's a big time name in the 2025 wide receiver class. And so just from that and watching Arizona, I have seen Noah Fafita, but you know, sometimes certain things aren't switched on in your brand. And I watched, I pulled up an Arizona tape to finally like really focus solely in on Noah Fafita. And in three seconds, I was like, Wow, he's he's tiny. He's tiny, tiny. He's he's not NFL size as a quarterback. Now, can you do that? Can you be drafted highly as that archetype? Right now, uh, Bryce Young's hurting the team very, very badly. But even if Bryce Young turns it around, you have to play like Bryce Young to get into that archetype. Noah Fafita has been solid, but I don't think he's been anywhere near that level. I mean, Bryce Young had won the Heisman at this point in his career. One other name to bring up in the early to Claire realm is Malik Murphy, the quarterback that is now at Duke. He used to be the Texas Longhorns backup quarterback. He is a very big, very big armed guy, right? Unlike Noel Fafita, unlike Cade Klubnik, right? If all three of these guys break out, Malik Murphy is the one you want, right? That's basically the way to put it. I can't tell you for sure who's going to be the best quarterback. I can't tell you who for sure is going to be the best quarterback next year. But if all three of these guys were to break out, Malik Murphy is the one the NFL is going to want because he's the biggest, he's got the biggest arm. It's also impressive to me whenever someone from a Texas, the job that they got to be the starting quarterback at is Duke. That says a little bit about the school you can get into because not everybody can get into Duke. That's very impressive as, you know, a young man. So I'm not trying to make too much of that, but it's just a small knock in Malik Murphy's favor. So Malik Murphy's a player that there was just a lot of positive buzz for. Like this guy's not going to start because we have Quinn Ewers and this guy might not ever start for us because we have Arch Manning, but we really, really like Malik Murphy and all these things about him and he didn't shine that much he did start two games i believe this year uh, for the texas longhorns and he was pretty erratic in those two starts but through the first two starts of his collegiate career he will be a true junior obviously that's why he's eligible for this list and just like connor wigman same thing here he's there's no possible way he can get anywhere close to 25 starts he can't even get near to where connor wigman can get to 25 starts so the chance that he's going to come out 
next year are, are very, very small. But Malik Murphy is, because of the physical traits and the upside, one of the major players that you should be looking out for. And, and, and if you do hear something about a guy like Malik Murphy breaking out, that's a guy more than a lot of people to be paying attention to. So that just about wraps me up for the early declares. And so now it is time to get into the senior quarterbacks, right? So we're going to start with Carson Beck, the quarterback from Georgia, who would be my number one senior quarterback and potentially my number one quarterback overall. And in fact, if we're just talking about quarterbacks who are going to come out in 2025 or likely, in my opinion, to come out in 2025 based on what we've talked about previously with Connor Wigman I would say that Carson Beck is definitely my quarterback one as of right now in the 2025 quarterback class now Carson Beck is a fifth year senior but Carson Beck is one of the youngest players I've ever evaluated from an original early declare age if that makes sense what I'm basically saying is if Carson Beck would have entered the NFL when he was first eligible three years out of high school he would have basically been as young as Braylon Allen who's constantly talked about as one of the youngest players a little bit older than Braylon Allen but closer by far than anybody I've ever evaluated to Braylon Allen in terms of age and so that makes him 22 years and nine months for his draft age next year Carson Beck is six foot four 220 pounds Against FBS opponents in 2023, Carson Beck completed 72.8% of his passes, 9.4 yards, 9.5 yards per attempt, 23 touchdowns, 6 interceptions. It's also worth noting that he had a significantly high PFF grade in 7 of his starts, which is a fairly high number. The biggest thing that sticks out right away in any kind of, say, advanced look over of uh, Carson Beck's stats is that he has the lowest time to throw in the entire FBS at 2.39 seconds. He is 63rd out of 95 in ADOT. So that's not necessarily great, but when you're looking at someone like Bo Nix, who's getting all this hype, at least a medium amount of hype, keep in mind, this is taken before the draft. If he went on the round six i apologize but bonix has gotten at least a medium amount of hype he has a t- fast time to throw operates quickly does these things quickly in the system all these things you talk about about Bo Nix Bo Nix does all that with a 93rd a dot Carson Beck does it with a 63rd a dot so it's still a low a dot right I'm not going to say that it's not a low a dot but with how quickly he's throwing the ball he is pushing the ball from time to time and at a higher rate than someone like a Bo Nix who does still have a, a substantial amount of heat behind him and I think the biggest thing with Carson Beck right now is that with that quick decision making he has a little bit of what I call the Jimmy Garoppolo I don't know what a, a other people think when I say that, but Jimmy Garoppolo to me is a guy who makes a lot of the right decisions, makes a lot of the right decisions quickly, but the problem with him in the Kyle Shanahan system, the thing that I think always actually drove them crazy more so than the injuries was that every now and then he would just throw it directly to a linebacker and he would do it probably more than the majority of quarterbacks in the NFL. He would just miss the linebacker. He would miss the safety. He would get so locked into the quick, quick, quick game system that they were dominating at that he would just overlook somebody because he hadn't been there, say, the three previous times or something like that. And so that is something that I do see in Carson Beck's game, but I see enough reading the field that I think there's at least a capacity for him to weed it out specifically because again, this is a guy who, despite being a senior, this was his first year starting at the SEC level. It's also important to note that I think there was a chance that if Carson Beck led Georgia to a national title, he would have entered this draft. And what's specifically significant about that, and I alluded to this earlier, is that Carson Beck did not play well in the postseason. He had two big-time throws and four turnover-worthy plays in the postseason. I don't think that's necessarily a pattern of anything, but it's definitely not finishing at the level he needed to. I think the most important thing about Carson Beck is the big arm plays over the middle of the field, uh, layered throws over the middle of the field, and also a, a little bit of mobility, right? Carson Beck one of the players that the one of the names that actually came to mind to me when I was thinking about the the level of mobility and the level of arm talent for Carson Beck was kind of like Ben Roethlisberger for the for the modern game right to where there there's a little bit of mobility there there's a little bit of physicality there there is a good amount of quick throws right and maybe that's what's biasing it in a little bit because the most recent versions of Ben Roethlisberger we've seen were those those quick 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 offenses in the in the Pittsburgh right so I think Carson Beck kind of reminds me of that a little bit a guy who gets the ball out really really quick uh, has a, an ability to naturally get the ball out really really quick is a big bodied guy and has just a little bit of mobility that he can you know get around in the pocket you're not going to have him 
him running very often downfield though if he has a lane he can he can get it and he's probably he's probably a more modern version of Ben Roethlisberger by which I just mean I don't think he's relatively more mobile compared to how uh, quarterbacks are in today's game but I do think he's probably a little bit more mobile than Ben Roethlisberger and we just probably can't see that because we're so used to how mobile quarterbacks are in today's game and so my bottom line really like the quick passing really like the potential for big accurate passes over the middle kind of like the whole uh, body of work that he put together but there were some downsides there were some turnovers it's not a very big sample yet this isn't a quarterback class with A's he's not an A but in a quarterback class of B's he's a B that I like a decent bit the other quarterback that I have in this tier or close to this tier I'm kind of debating how I feel about him a little bit more is Shadur Sanders the quarterback from Colorado and now in just the exact same way that we just talked about with Carson Beck but again in the opposite maybe I should have used Shadur Sanders as the comparison I probably would have if I would have been thinking ahead but the age report on Shadur Sanders suggests that he is a year older than he quote-unquote should be right so whether he reclassified whether he was held back a year I don't really know but according to the number of years he's been in college you would expect him based on his birthday to be 22 years and seven months as of the draft year in this case but he would be 23 years and seven months as of september 1st 2025 so that is roughly the same age as Jaden daniels this year who's been talked about as this older quarterback prospect now again i'm assuming Jaden daniels went in the top five of the nfl draft maybe the top two and that's a very significant thing obviously so it's not like this is going to hold Shadur sanders back but it is i think a significant negative that people don't necessarily necessarily acknowledge as much on his profile yet because I haven't really done the math to see where he's going to be at that stage but 23 years seven months is a fairly old age for a quarterback prospect so that's just a significant fact of the matter there six foot two 215 pounds for Shadur Sanders he is fairly mobile but it's kind of like it's weird because I feel like Shadur Sanders is both overrated and underrated in his mobility because it kind of depends on where you're coming from if you're someone who looks only at college football stats because college football stats include sacks he almost never has rushing yards right his rushing yards at Colorado this year were 111 carries for negative 77 yards so I mean obviously that looks horrible and if you're someone who's looking at the stats you're going to think that even if you're applying the sacks it's hard to look at that and think that the guy's rushing the ball a lot at the same time there's probably people that don't look at the sacks at all and they just go oh this is Deion Sanders kid he must be really really fast and so his rushing yards if you take out the sacks were 379 I think that does a really good job of showing who he is his mobility is probably closer to like a Bo Nix, right? Bo Nix is reasonably mobile. He's not super fast. He's not going to break a ton of tackles, but he's reasonably mobile. And I think that's closer, maybe a little bit more, but I think that's closer to where Shadur Sanders is. So I think he's both overrated and underrated, depending on who you ask or where you're coming from. The first five games of the season, Shadur Sanders was incredible statistically at the least, and really incredible overall, right? The last five and a half games were a lot worse than that. The completion percentage went down from 74.4% to 62.7%. He had 300 fewer passing yards, despite that being a little bit longer of a sample. He had three fewer touchdowns. The big time throw to turn over where the plays went from three to one to two to one. Again, still solid there, still doing some good things there, but not nearly as good as the open of the season. And it's important to note in those statistics that the offensive system that Jadur Sanders was running in those first five games is known as the Veer and Shoot. And the Veer and Shoot is the exact same system that Tennessee runs. So if you're someone who follows these prospect circles a lot, you probably remember the narrative coming out from Hendon Hooker when people were talking about it's very difficult to grade his offense. A lot of the stats are very easy to come by so to speak and that it's just uh, part of the reason that you can see him put up such great numbers in the SEC and then be a backup that doesn't get a lot of talk about and a third round pick even with the ACL injury is somewhat because of the system he plays in so that is kind of Part of the concern there is when the numbers drop off when you go away from this system. They went from the Veer and Shoot to Pat Shermer, the, to that offense. Yes, that Pat Shermer. Uh, so Pat Shermer is going to be the offensive coordinator for Shadur Sanders next year. And I think this is kind of one of those double-edged things to where I think it's going to hurt the perception of him potentially in some ways because I think it's going to be a harder offense to put up statistics in. At least the the media perception, I should say, or the the, the Twitter media perception, I should say. But I do think there's at least a chance that obviously playing in an offensive system with a coordinator who has been in the NFL before is going to be something that's 
looked at by teams as something that's helping prepare him a little bit better for the NFL. So if you're asking me right now, I would, again, because this is a quarterback class full of Bs, what I would project his draft stock to be, what I would project his level of hype versus performance to be, to be kind of on the Will Levis trajectory. And I could think he could finish at the same place that Will Levis did too in the late first, early second. Now, Will Levis didn't actually have a great final season. If Shadur Sanders has a great final season, that can up that trajectory and put him further and further into the first round. So I think Shadur Sanders is a very good quarterback prospect. I think a lot of those things are, are going to go well for him. And oh, the sacks is just the very big thing. And I also want to talk about this in the context of college football really quick, because a lot of people do watch Colorado because of all the 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 positivity around Deion Sanders, or at least the buzz and the press around Deion Sanders, the sacks are kind of a hard thing to make sense of with Shadur Sanders because he's taken so, so, so many of them and his pressure to sack ratio isn't necessarily very good. But the number of pressures, the number of sacks, the you know, the fact of the matter is that they got a lot of guys to, to come to Colorado last year. But there were even at the time, there are a lot of people that I listen to that do a lot in the recruiting business, in the uh, in the transfers, in all these kind of things that were saying the offensive linemen they're bringing in are not starters. The offensive linemen they're bringing in are third stringers. The offensive linemen they're bringing in are camp bodies. And you saw that come to fruition. And when they started having, say, some wear and tear down the season two, they really didn't have anybody to go to. The transfers they're getting in this year, the talent they're getting in this year is far, far, far more legitimate. The same sources I listened to that said that the talent they were getting last year was overhyped are the same people that are saying that the offensive line talent they're getting in this year is far more substantial. So this is an offensive line that last year they might have had to say five guys to start the year that they felt good about on like a three-star level or should have felt good about on like a three-star level. They probably got like eight or nine this year with a couple of them trending towards being closer to four stars. And so that's a big difference. And so my bottom line with Shadur Sanders ultimately comes down to the idea that my hope for Shadur Sanders is that this offensive line plays well enough that we get to evaluate Shadur Sanders. Because the problem with last year's tape is that a lot of it is really hard to evaluate because he is just under the this just extreme distress and so bottom line you just hope that you get the fair shake with the offensive line quinn ewers is the quarterback that i think a lot of people would expect to be in that tier and to be fair he's not that far off for me from carson beck and Shadur sanders but i do think that i'm just I'm just generally growing more and more concerned, specifically with Quinn Ewers' ability to throw the ball deep. There's also, like, when you take away the fact that he was this 10 out of 10 high school prospect, one of the highest high school rated prospects ever, he doesn't actually have the appearance of a top, top flight NFL quarterback talent. Now, don't get me wrong, the arm is crazy. The arm can do some very impressive things. But he is six foot two, 195 pounds, 195 pounds. He did slim down to become more mobile is the way they always pitch it. But it's kind of like, okay, but you got to add some healthy weight back. You understand that, right? Because 195 pounds is very, very light for the NFL game. His age as of September 1st would be 22 years, six months. And the biggest thing to note about Quinn Ewers is just that his deep ball accuracy, his deep ball completion percentage has been very, very, very bad throughout his career. He has been 55th of 91 quarterbacks with at least 40 attempts in 2023 with a 34% deep completion percentage. And the biggest thing about this is you might say, well, okay, there are 91 quarterbacks, so 55th, maybe 55th isn't that bad, okay? And I'm just making up arguments. Okay, well, look at where the NFL quarterbacks stack up. Jaden Daniels, first. J.J. McCarthy, second. Caleb Williams, fourth. Bo Nix, 5th, Drake May, 13th, Michael Pratt, 17th, Spencer Rattler, 20th, Penix, 22nd, top, the top 8 quarterbacks in the 2023 draft by consensus are all in the top 22. So here's some more quarterbacks that are going to be on this list today. Jalen Milrow, 10th, Jackson Dart, 26th, Shitter Sanders, 27th, Carson Beck, 29th, K. Klubnick, 30th, Cameron Ward, 31st, Preston Stone, 32nd, Noah Fafita, 49th. Drew Aller is the only quarterback, and he didn't actually get to the qualifying pass attempts there, but Drew Aller is the only quarterback on this list who is below him other than also Malik Murphy but Malik Murphy was an actual really small sample at three of 12. Connor Wigman has a very small sample and was very good in his very small sample. So between about the 17 say quarterbacks that are going to be discussed in any capacity on today's list Quinn Ewers is between say 15th and 16th in that deep ball completion percentage. Now anyone who listens to the show knows that this is something that I also have a red flag on 
with Xavier Worthy. And that's because I believe they're both independently bad at this. It is not an either or thing for me. I believe they both have independent problems in this area. So potentially there are uh, an opportunity for this to be fixed. Is there an opportunity? Is there a chance this year where the new wide receivers come in and all of a sudden we learn that Isaiah Bond, despite probably not running a 4 one because very few people run a 4 one we learned that Isaiah Bond is actually a much better deep downfield passer or receiver than Xavier Worthy. I think that's very, very possible at the very least, but I still don't really trust Quinn Ewers to have that good deep ball yet. Developing that good deep ball is going to be essential for him to make the most of what he has. It is important to note that he is very good in the intermediate game. Maybe some of that is the Sarkeesian offense, but I think I think the real thing to get at with Quinn Ewers is that Carson Beck gets called a system quarterback a lot because of the Georgia system, and I get that, but Quinn Ewers is the system quarterback. Quinn Ewers doesn't get called a system quarterback because it's like once you have a 10 out of 10 prospect grade, you can never be called a system quarterback because you must create so many things for yourself because you have a 10 out of 10 prospect grade. And it's like, no, Quinn Ewers is the one that doesn't create that many things for himself. Quinn Ewers is the guy, I think, more than other quarterbacks on this list where I watch the games and I'm like, wait, wait, whoa, whoa, what? You just had a first and goal in a crucial game and you went run, 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 scream. Does that mean that you don't trust this guy at all? Because that's what you're telling me. When Steve Sarkeesian goes run, 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 screen on the goal line, that says, I don't trust my quarterback to throw into the end zone to me. Like, that is a weird thing to me. And I see that more and more. And maybe it's just because I do have Quinn Ewers in a Devi League and I overpaid for him in a Devi League. And so maybe I'm just watching him more on things like that. But, and Steve Sarkeesian likes to do a lot of those paint by numbers things regardless. So maybe it's just that. But it really does feel at times to me like they don't trust him in crucial situations to do downfield things that aren't simply one to two things. Maybe he can develop in that and between injuries and between COVID and between missing a year and between reclassifying, he has had problems with consistent playtime. So maybe with a consistent playtime, things like the deep ball, things like reading out the field in contested areas, these things will come along. But right now I have significant concerns about Quinn Ewers. And so next up, Cameron Ward, the transfer from Washington State, who is going to Miami of Florida. Cameron Ward will be 23 years, three months as of September 1st, 2025. He is six foot two, 223 pounds. And the interesting thing about Cam Ward is he had a little bit of a draft fan. A lot of people believed that he was going to be a part of the 2024 class. Why did they believe that, you ask? Because he told people that he was going to be a part of the 2024 draft class. He is the only player that I know of, and I followed the Declares and the Declare News very, very, very closely. He is the only player that I know of that came out at one point and said, I am going to the NFL draft, and then came out later and said, Actually, I'm going to Miami. I, I think Miami's got some good things for me. And there are some rumors that said that he really, really wanted to go to the NFL, which would potentially suggest that he didn't think he would get a chance to start or a legitimate chance to start based on the draft capital grade that he was going to get. But one thing that's very just interesting with the Miami location, the Miami location isn't going to get a ton of buzz, but Miami has a very good offensive line. Mario Cristobal is a joke in late game situations, which I just say because the the thing that a lot of NFL people know about Mario Cristobal is that he is mismanaged in game situations worse than any coach in college football. But as a recruiter, he is a heck of a recruiter. He's one of the best recruiters in college football. That's why he had a job at Oregon and was like poached to go to Miami and people really, really wanted him at Miami. And he's a former Miami guy too, but that's not the reason. The reason he's there is because he's such a good recruiter and he's been bringing in these offensive line recruits the last couple of years. He's been there and we're really seeing the culmination of the efforts and people around college football know this is one of the best offensive lines in college football. So it'll be interesting to see a guy who has the creative aspects, who can be a little bit of a Houdini in the pocket, who can get the ball downfield and can make big throws downfield, even if he hasn't necessarily done it consistently consistently through his college career. It'll be interesting to see if Cam Ward can make the most of that situation. Cam Ward's background is very interesting to me because he went to a high school that did not really ask him to throw the ball a lot, which is one of the main reasons he went to the FCS level first. The first year he was there was the year they got canceled for 2020. So he, his first season was a spring season, a spring 2020 season, and then he played 2021. Uh, within those two years, he won the Jerry Rice Award. I can't remember if that's for being the best newcomer to FCS football or the MVP in FCS. Either way, it's called the Jerry Rice Award. So that's pretty cool. But Cam Ward is, is always the Cam Ward is the definition of the player that I define as I want to like him more than I like him. 
when I got into, when I saw him transferring to Washington State the first time a while ago, I was very, very excited about the idea of Cameron Ward. I would have never valued him super, super highly as a guy we'd never seen play FBS football, but I really liked the idea of him. I wanted to buy into him. I watched the whole season, wanted to buy into him, and I just couldn't. And I was actually really close to being completely out because the number of big time throws in his first year was very, very scary. He barely threw any big time throws in his first year. Maybe that was a little bit of the offense, the air raid uh, that they were playing. But at the end of the day, that's just something you do not want to see from a prospect. Now that number turned around a little bit, but Cam Ward is still a guy who just has a very high negative play rate. When Cam Ward was rumored to go to Ohio State, I really thought to myself, like, I don't know if that's the right move for Ohio State. Now, don't get me wrong. It probably is because he's probably so talented that you would take it. But my point in thinking about that was just that Ohio State, your big thing is that you can just get it to wide receivers who are excellent. These guys can just win. Cam Ward is the kind of guy who's more likely to put you into some bad situations because he makes a negative play, a truly negative play, throws the ball away, takes a bad sack, a really bad sack, uh, fumbles the ball. He has a pretty significant fumbling issue. It's not that he's necessarily, you know, it's interesting. He doesn't have a ton of games with fumbles for how many fumbles he has, but he's had four games with at least two fumbles in in just 2023. He had four games with at least two fumbles and he had two games with at least three fumbles. So when he's not taking care of the ball, it, when it rains, it pours with Cameron. War. I think that's the kind of quarterback Cameron Ward is. He's he's the kind of guy who can do a lot of very positive things, very good things, but when it rains, it pours. So uh, a hot and cold quarterback, Cameron Ward is a player I, I wanted to love, but I haven't been able to convince myself to love yet. I get a, a lot of questions about him. He's a player that a lot of people like because of the high upside play. If he can show in a more contained situation at Miami behind a really good offensive line that when slowed down a little bit, he can cut out some of those turnover-worthy plays and make the most of the positive play around him. I think he does have a lot of upside there. The ratio of turnover-worthy plays, the amount of negative play in his game, is the reason that I don't have him any higher than where I do right now. I think the last quarterback on this senior list that gets a significant amount of buzz is most likely the Alabama starting quarterback, Jalen Milrow. Jalen Milrow will be 22 years, seven months as of September 1st, 2025. He is six foot two, 220. But the main and sole reason, not to say that there's not other things that he does well, but the sole reason that he's a player that people are talking about in fantasy leagues is that he is by far the best rusher on the list today. Jalen Milrow to me is a player who is very unlikely to be an NFL starting quarterback, at least at this point. But if he were to become an NFL starting quarterback, he would be the kind of guy who would immediately have elite fantasy upside. There's also one thing that Jalen Milrow does extremely well, and that is throw an excellent deep ball. Now you might think between the deep ball and the rushing, wouldn't that be enough? But there are some significant concerns about how he reads the game everywhere else, how he targets those players when they're not wide open down the field. There's also some issues with how often he takes sacks for pressures. Uh, There's there's just quite a few things here, right? 3.44 time to throw, by far the highest in the college football landscape. So this is a player who I think you really do have more significant evidence than a lot of others that he struggles to read out the field. Now, maybe that's something that he can develop. But right now, when you look at the pressure to sack ratio, when you look at the 3.44 second time to throw, those are things that give you some legitimate concerns. And then when you also consider the fact that he is one of the most accurate deep ball throwers, and then look at all the rest of the numbers, it does show that in the easier areas of the field, he is statistically hitting at a lower rate than he's supposed to. As much as he can create some easier things for the rest of the team in the rushing game, as that's the benefit of the rushing quarterback, he's not taking the easier things that quarterbacks need to be able to take to be able to be successful successful at the NFL level. So right now, Jalen Milrow is a very long way off from being someone who I think is going to be drafted with the intention of being one of the 32 starters, but he is someone who's always going to be in the conversation because if he is one of the 32 NFL starters, that's going to be a really high upside guy. So now we're getting into a little bit more of the dark horse category, at least compared to what I've seen uh, on the market. This is a guy, don't be, don't get me wrong, this is a guy that I've seen a lot of people talk about for a few years. He used to name that I don't see quite as much, starting with 
Jackson Dart, the quarterback from Ole Miss. And I like Jackson Dart better than than a few quarterbacks on this list. I think it's important to note that uh, his early declare age would be really close to Anthony Richardson, who is the youngest quarterback that I've evaluated on, you know, the last three or four years. Uh, Jackson Dart then would be 22 years, four months as of September 1st. So obviously he wouldn't be that young because he wouldn't be an early, early declare. He'd be one year older, but he is still the youngest senior on this list. Six foot two, 220 pounds. And he plays in a Lane Kiffin system that is very system heavy. But it's also important to note that next to Jalen Milrow, Jackson Dart is probably the most mobile quarterback on this list. And now he's not extremely mobile. There is a huge tear gap between Jalen Milrow and Jackson Dart, but he is a a mobile quarterback with a good amount of rushing upside. The big problem I think with Jackson Dart is when you see hot and cold games in someone's profile, when they go to a school like Old Miss, you get really worried that the hot games are Lane Kiffin being in his bag and the cold games are when Lane Kiffin can't you know, get in his bag, not to use the same phrase yet, phrases twice, but the big point being that you really struggle to see uh, Jackson Dart play outside of the system a lot in a situation like this. That said, you do see a lot of accuracy. You do see a lot of balls that come out at slightly different angles. You see the ability to kind of take something off and, and float one in there. And so I think you see a lot of the things in Jackson Dart that you look for, for a prospect, even if it's a little hard to read out in the RPO heavy schemed up uh, version of whatever Lane Kiffin runs at Old Miss. I think these kind of conversations about like how good exactly he is are probably things that are going to take way too long for a show that you're going over 60 players. But for Jackson Dart, I just think he's an important guy to keep an eye on because he's mobile, because he has a very good arm, because he has the ability to be pretty accurate. He's not quite what you're looking for in a production perspective as of yet but if he has just a little bit more consistency next year Jackson Dart is somebody who uh, should be paid quite a bit attention to as a potential 2025 quarterback prospect the bigger dark horse I think is probably Preston Stone the SMU quarterback Preston Stone is six foot one 219 pounds and he was a fairly high four-star high school prospect despite the fact that he went to SMU and it's important to note right off the bat that SMU this year is going to play in the Atlantic Coast Conference because apparently they've moved to the Atlantic Coast Preston Stone is one of the most interesting statistical conversations I think that we're going to have on this entire show, even if it ends up being like a four hour show with an hour per position, though we're, we're not doing an hour on tight ends. That's not happening. But the big thing I guess I'm getting at is that Preston Stone throws the ball downfield so often that it kind of skews uh, completion percentage, right? So why don't I like completion percentage? I really haven't had this conversation yet on the podcast, at least as far as what I've recorded to when I'm, I'm recording this 2025 show, which is before the draft. But the reason I don't like completion percentage as, as a stat in just an, even in theory is that any kind of statistic that claims to be on accuracy but doesn't adjust for the depth of the target is fundamentally broken in the idea that it's accuracy because somebody who's throwing within three yards of the line of scrimmage should be able to have a much higher completion percentage than someone throwing downfield. Preston Stone is chucking the ball more than anybody in the sport. Preston Stone had only 43.2% of his pass attempts be between nine yards or fewer, including behind the line of scrimmage. I couldn't find any player in the draftable range that was below 50% other than Jalen Milrow, who we've already talked about having this kind of also extreme thing where he holds the ball for a really long time, doesn't really read out the middle of the field, and then just chucks it deep. Preston Stone, maybe there's some similar things there. Maybe it is an issue of reading the the field, but it's important to note that he was just a very good quarterback when throwing the ball down the field. He flashes in a number of these big time throw categories, throwing the ball down the field. He was the most accurate quarterback in completion percentage in the intermediate game as well. Now, he didn't just not throw the ball short. When he threw the ball short, he had a proportionally low completion percentage. He had 68.8% of passes between zero and nine yards completed out of 117 quarterbacks i screened for that was 105th of 117 so the big thing with preston stone in that completion percentage is is there something that's not allowing him to complete short passes or are these just kind of a fluctuation in the short passes combined with how often he goes deep and when you really put it together he should be completing a higher percentage of his passes at least the way that we currently think about or 
typically think about the stats. So Preston Stone is a player that I don't hear anybody talking about really. I mean, sometimes you do because he does have the high school recruitment status and SMU does have a lot of football fans. But Preston Stone is a player that I don't hear that many people talking about in these kind of circles. And I do think he's a dark horse to be an NFL guy. Now, to be clear, I don't think anybody on this list is an A and he probably doesn't even have A upside. He probably has B, B plus upside. But I do think that he's a guy that I'm at least going to be paying attention to until he proves to me that I shouldn't be paying attention to him. I have a couple more quick hitters, starting with some transfers. That's the that's just a category that I'm going to go through right now. I'm not going to talk about these guys very much because if I, if I liked them more than I liked them, I'd probably have them in the longer version of the segment. Will Howard used to be at Kansas State, now going to Ohio State, has excellent size, but I'm not necessarily sure he's ever been where he needs to be as a passer, which kind of creates a natural conversation or natural transition to Riley Leonard, who's largely the same thing. He started at Duke, went to Notre Dame, and I think when a lot of people saw him getting hyped up, they just assumed he was a good passer or a really good passer or an efficient passer. Riley Leonard's a very good runner. Riley Leonard's a very good quarterback runner, but he has never been an efficient passer, the level that you need to be for the NFL level. So maybe Riley Leonard can add that. If Riley Leonard adds the efficient passing, if he can develop as a as an efficient passer, he'll have the same offensive coordinator that Desmond Ritter and Jaden Daniels have had in recent memory. So maybe if he can develop as an accurate passer, he'll be somebody with the rushing upside that people look into a little bit more, especially in the same area that Desmond Ritter dra- was drafted in, but not super high on Riley Leonard, even as a fan of the Notre Dame fighting Irish because he's just not the most accurate quarterback and he's never been the most efficient passer. Brock Vandegrift is actually the transfer I'm most intrigued by just because it's kind of this thing of a lack of proof or a lack of showing me things that are negatives more so the other guys have more negatives that's essentially because they've played more football and I don't mean to hold that against them but sometimes being exposed to players is what bumps them down your list a little bit. Brock Vandegrift has just been behind other starting quarterbacks at the University of Georgia. Now, he's not a Will Levis clone physically, but there are a lot of similarities, and I don't know if I've said it, Brock Vandegrift going from Georgia to Kentucky. There are a lot of similarities in the situation of Will Levis. Brock Vandegrift was a very highly recruited quarterback, sat behind guys for three, four years. Now he'll transfer to Kentucky, a school that's been known in recent memory to try to run a lot more of the NFL system and bring in NFL guys to run their offense. The transfer with the highest Heisman odds is probably Dylan Gabriel, who left Oklahoma for Oregon. But Dylan Gabriel is an undersized quarterback that I just don't necessarily see as an NFL guy. Maybe I'm wrong on that. Maybe he proves me wrong on that. The last guy to transfer to Oregon, I would have potentially said the same thing about, though I do think Bo Nix has a much better arm and is more NFL sized. So I think that's kind of the problem with Dylan Gabriel is I just tried to make that comparison and then I immediately realized I don't really think it works because the tools are so much worse with Dylan Gabriel, but he he is someone who's been a good college quarterback and with the quarterback position being what what it is i don't want to dismiss people who are good college quarterbacks and will be at schools like oregon where they can make a big impact so just to recap i think carson beck Connor Wigman and Shadur Sanders are the three I'm valuing the highest with Drew Aller very, very close to that tier. And if Drew Aller's not in that tier, he's alone in the next tier. After that, the two quarterbacks I'm valuing the most highly are Quinn Ewers and Jackson Dart. I do have Preston Stone as kind of a preferable next step, but I don't know if that's just me trying to find somebody that I don't see as many people talking about. And ultimately in a quarterback class that I'm saying, I don't expect to maybe even have one or two guys actually deserve to be first round picks as of right now now things are going to change you know the the sixth best quarterback is a pretty low grade overall so that's how i feel about this 2025 quarterback class at least as of this point in march the full podcast including a bit more context can be found under the fancy for real title wherever you get your podcasts goodbye